Okay, this is the fifth chapter of the course where I'll be discussing object detection. Until now, in the previous chapters, we have seen the concepts of classical computer vision and also we have learned about convolutional neural networks. Before proceeding to object detection, let's revisit the definitions a bit. What is classification? You just look at an image and tell me what kind of object is there within the image. What is localization? You not only identify the object, but also you locate where exactly it is present within the image. The red box around this cat is called as the bounding box. Pictorially, you have to depict the location of this object using the bounding box. And uh, what is object detection? If there are more than one objects in an image, then identifying and locating all of them is the case of object detection. For example, in this image, you have to locate these uh, cats, this duck and the dog. And you have to draw the bounding box for all these objects. In this chapter, first I'll be beginning with localization, then we'll proceed to object detection. Just to recap, in a convolution neural network like VGGNet, TelexNet, etc., the convolution and pooling layers will act as feature extractors, the fully connected and softmax layers act as classifiers. If you compare this with the classical computer vision based techniques, the hog and sift act as feature extractors, and SVM will act as classifier. So, this is typically the classification pipeline in using a CNN. You have an image, you input through the convolution and pooling layers. These convolution and pooling layers will give you feature maps, stretch out the feature maps into one dimensional vector, and feed it to your classification layer, which has fully connected layers. The last part will consist of one fully connected layer plus a softmax. This softmax takes the scores or outputs from the fully connected layer and converts them to probabilities. And depending on which class has the highest probability, you will conclude that uh, this image has a cat. Taking the same thing, how do you modify the classification pipeline to do localization? That is, there is only one object in an image. How do you locate that object? And to do localization, we need to we need a bounding box. We need to draw the bounding box around the object. And to draw a bounding box, you need two points. That is, if I have these two points, I can draw this rectangle. And a point is represented by the x and y coordinates. And uh, so for two points, I need four numbers, x1, y1, x2, y2. Or there is another way of re representing the bounding box. That is, you take the center of the box and also give the height and width. So you have x0, y0, h and w. So even in this case, you will need four numbers. In this chapter, for the ease of explanation, I'll be taking this as an example. But uh, practically in many papers, they use this concept to give the bounding box. So if you take this image as example, this will be your x1, y1 and this will be x2, y2. So the question is, how do you give out these numbers? It might appear very difficult, but actually if you look at the network in the last layer, it's very easy to do this. What does the last layer of your network consist of? If you expand this last layer, it will have one fully connected layer followed by softmax. What does this fully connected layer have? It will have scores for different classes. Let's say you have 10 classes in your uh, network, like human, car, dog, etc. And for each of this class, you will have some score. For example, human might have a score of uh, 10, 9, 2, then this will be 4, 3, minus 1, something. And uh, for for this class that is the, uh, that is in this image, for example, boat, the score might be very high, let's say 50. And uh, what softmax does this? It will take these numbers and convert them to probabilities. Maybe for the boat, the probability will be highest, say in 0.95. And for all other classes, the probability will be very close to zero. So that's how we know that it's a boat. Now, with this knowledge, how do you modify the last fully connected layer to give you four numbers instead of one? So basically what this fully connected layer is giving, it'll, it is giving you one score per class. For every class, it will give one score. But what, what we need is we need four scores. So we just need to modify the last fully connected layer as shown here. So I'll just modify it to give, you, uh, give me four scores, which will correspond to x1, y1, x2, y2. So with these scores, now I can draw the bounding box. So I'll have one set of scores for each of these classes. Okay. But uh, the question is, how will I teach the network to give me the correct bounding boxes? That is the coordinates of these bounding boxes. How will I teach the network to give me? For that, I can train the network using something called L2 loss. Let's see what it is. If you take this network, which is of dimension 600 by 800, this will be the coordinates of x1, y1, 200, 250, x2, y2 will be 600, 400. The same thing is shown here. And I will use these as the expected values. That is, my, my network should give out these values. 
So these are the ex expected values of x1, y1, x2, y2. We already know that your uh, CNN, that is convolution and pooling layers, will give you some feature maps which I expand to a one dimensional vector. And in these vectors, at all the locations, I'll have some values. Okay. And uh, when I start the training, we know that the fully connected layers, all the weights, will be initialized to values of 0.1 in all the fully connected layers. And uh, please note that uh, here I'll not be using any softmax because I don't need any probability scores here. I just need the actual values, actual values of x1, y1, x2, y2. So I'll not be using any softmax layer here. So this is how my network will look initially with all the weights initialized to 0.1. Now when I feed these values, the feature map values through this network with all the weights initialized to 0.1, I might get this value as output. Please note that these are just hypothetical values that I am using for explanation. These are not uh, real examples. So this value 0, 0, 800, 600 will correspond to these points 0, 0 and 800, 600 which will be this red box matching the dimensions of this image. Later I will calculate the L2 loss. What is L2 loss? Uh, first of all, what is L1, L1 loss? If you have two numbers, say 10 and 15, you just take the magnitude of the differences between these values. That is 10 minus 15 mod. You will get 5. Similarly, L2 loss will be nothing but you do 10 minus 15 and do the whole square. Because you are squaring, this is called L2 loss. And uh, because you are not doing, uh, taking the square of these numbers, this is called L1 loss. Basically, this is the power of 1, this is the power of 2, something like that. So, this is the prediction of my network and I need to calculate the L2 loss. So I'll do 200 minus 0, 250 minus 0 whole square, then 600 minus 800 whole square and so on and so forth. Once I have all these values, I'll just add it up. I'll get this as the loss, which is a very high value. Now what I'll do, I'll back propagate all these losses through the fully connected layers. This time from 0 0.1 and so on, the weights will get updated to maybe 1, 2, minus 1, 4 and so on. So the same thing will happen in the, all the layers. So with these new weights now, the same feature map output, I'll take the dot product and forward propagate through the fully connected layers. This time with the new set of weights, this might be the output that you, my network gave. 100, 150, 700, 700, 700 and 450, which will correspond to the orange box. Again, I'll calculate the loss and I'll back propagate the loss through the network and the weights will get further updated. So some other, uh, some other changes will happen to these weights. With the new set of weights, this might be the network's prediction corresponding to the green box. Here the loss is a very small value, just 250. And uh, when I again back propagate uh, this loss through the network, these weights will get updated with a very small value. Maybe 4 will become 4.5 and so on and so forth. And with this new set of weights, now I'll get the correct output corresponding to the yellow box here, which is matching with the ground truth. So this is how I will train the network to give me the correct bounding boxes. Initially, it will output some random values, but I will calculate the loss and back propagate through the network. I will keep doing this until the network gives me the correct output. Once it gives, I will just save these weights. So this way, the network will remember to give correct bounding boxes for different objects. For example, if I train the network with lots and lots of images, then once the training is finished, whenever it sees the front view or back view of a car, what it will do is it will give the bounding box where the width is slightly higher than the height. But if it finds a car in a side view, it will give a bounding box where the width is very much larger than the height. On the same lines, if it looks at a person who is standing, it will give a bounding box where the height is much larger than the width. But if the same person is sitting, the height and width will be somewhat comparable. And on the same lines, for different objects, if it looks at a monitor or a TV, the bounding box which will be more squarish. So this way, it will learn the properties for different objects. What kind of bounding boxes it has to give? What should be the relative dimensions? It learn all these properties. And uh, that is how the network will learn to give correct outputs for different kinds of objects. And uh, also note that few, few other important points. Let's say if this is the image that I give as input to my uh, network. Now that your network has learned the general properties of different objects, it knows uh, somewhat that your car doesn't end here. Even though the rest of the car is not visible in this image, it knows that the dimension of car will stretch even further. So accordingly, it will take a guess and give me this bounding box. So this is a very common when you are working practically with different images. So with this, you know that the network has become very intelligent 
and even though it is not uh, seeing the object completely it can guess the dimensions of these objects in this case my network could have guessed that okay the car will stretch up to this point okay and even the height it will guess accordingly because the tires might stretch up to here also note that if a larger part of the car is visible in the image then the accuracy of this bounding box will be more for example here it will guess that the width of the car is just 500 and the height is 300 but in this image since more part of the car is visible here it will guess that the width of the car is 600 and the height is 300 that is this bounding box is more accurate compared to this one so here we need to know two things even if the object is not uh, completely visible in the image the uh, network can still guess the correct bounding box but if the object is uh, visible more clearly then the accuracy of the bounding box will be higher and uh, lastly whenever it gives the bounding box that is exceeding the image dimensions we just have to trim it okay so that's the thing about the bounding boxes now combining both the classifiers and the bounding box regressors uh, together this is how my network will look these are the convolution part acting as feature extractors and this will be the classifier layer and this will be the bounding box regressor remember that we can't get rid of this classifier because all that this bounding box gives is the dimensions of uh, this object but it doesn't tell you what kind of object it is to know what kind of object i still need the classifier and the uh, second thing to note is that i don't need separate convolution and pooling layers one for classifier and one for bounding box regressor because we have already seen this several times the convolution and pooling layers act as generic feature extractors since these are generic i don't need one separate uh, layer for the classifier and one separate uh, set of weights for the bounding box regressor the same feature maps would be sufficient to train and infer both these values the last question is how do you combine these two uh, results to do the prediction let's say in my data set i have three classes person boat and tv and uh, these are the outputs from my classifier the fully connected and softmax layers will give me this confidence scores and uh, this is the output from my bounding box regressor for these three classes which i will take in this table now for each class i will look at both the scores and the same thing is depicted in this image so for the person the confidence score is 0.02 and these are the bounding box coordinates for the tv this is the confidence score and these are the bounding box coordinates and for the boat this is the confidence score and bounding box coordinates note that here in this image we know that there is no person and there is no tv but the network can't leave these outputs blank irrespective of whether the object is present or not it will blindly do all the calculations but only by looking at the confidence score we know that these bounding box values don't make any sense that's how we discard these scores and we consider only those scores which have a high confidence value so this way we can combine the classifier and the bounding box regressor to do localization in the next video we'll see how we can do object detection that is detect multiple objects in an image